Hello and welcome to episode 333 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? Good, Andy. We're back after a, a week's break and um, yeah, I, I, I can't say I feel necessarily refreshed because in the end I didn't go away as planned. So various reasons and actually I ended up working probably half the time that I had planned to take off with the with the children so I am good it's good to be back good to be on the show but what is interesting is that my getaway with the children and my wife in the UK has been delayed now till next week which means technically we've got something a little bit different that's never happened on the podcast before because ordinarily I might say to you we won't have a show next week because I won't be here but we've got a team So we're doing something that's never happened before next week, which is something to look forward to. We're going to be doing a Money to the Masses podcast show without me on it. We're on episode 333, and I think I can honestly say it will be the first episode that I've never actually featured. You've had a few episodes where you've not been on, Andy. I remember one time you were locked away in a sealed diving unit, I think, or something in in Warwick University doing something for the uh, national newspaper, the bizarre life that Andy Leakes actually lives. But next week, what we're going to do is going to be a team takeover. So I'm leaving it to the rest of the team to do next week's show. So I'm going to say to Andy, don't break anything. I'll be listening to the show while I'm away and then we'll... (laughs) We'll come back and we'll be back to normal the week after. And I imagine it all depends on how we get on as to whether that will ever happen again. <laughs> Next week, we'll find out. <laughs> is it is it a bit like when people go away and they leave their home empty and then somebody has a big party and it all goes wrong and then they vow never to leave their kids at home again? Perhaps it's a bit like that. I'm quite looking forward to it. So we're going to have that next week, but we're on back to normal this week. And so I'm going to tell you what's going to be on this week's show. There's going to be three pieces as ever. The first one is by request. A couple of weeks ago in podcast 331 I talked about the money mistakes to avoid in your 20s and 30s and I put it out there people wanted me to do another piece but focusing on your 40s and 50s then get in touch and I'll do that and you did get in touch so we're going to do that on this week's podcast. We're going to finish off the show on a piece regarding online passwords so that's very relevant when it comes to your money and online security and Andy is going to do a third piece on yeah well we've covered buying cars before but we've tended to focus on buying new cars and how you would finance that well we've had quite a lot of talk in the groups lately the money to the masses community groups and other groups talking about how to buy used cars how you do it where best to buy it from what to look out for so I'll be covering all of that in a piece this week Great. So I'm going to kick off straight into the money mistakes to avoid in your 40s and 50s. So as I said in the introduction, go back to podcast 331, because there was a whole load of mistakes to avoid that related to your 20s and 30s. But many of them are things that you will want to avoid throughout life. They're not just specific to your 20s and 30s, although some of them were not all of them. Now, the first one I'm going to say is ignoring your pension. Because you've got to the point in life when you're in your 40s, and that includes me and you, Andy, where retirement might feel a long way away, but it isn't as far as you think. So it's something you can't just keep putting off tackling. So that means you need to make a plan. If you haven't made a plan already, you need to start to think about what your retirement might look like and how you might fund it because you won't be able to work for the rest of your life or you might want to try to, but realistically, most of us wouldn't be able to do that. So the first thing I want people to do is go out there and find all their pension statements. So don't ignore your pension. That's a big mistake. Go and find out the information about the pensions you've got and pull it all together and start to look at it and analyze it. Now, pensions are one of the times when it pays to go and get advice if you are really stuck, especially if you've got a final salary pension. But once you've got all the information and most people will have defined contribution pension pots so they're just the pension pots you pay money into and then that money is invested and it grows and then you will use that pot of money to provide an income in retirement now go to calculators.moneytothemasses.com forward slash pension and that's our pension calculator we'll put a link in the show notes and i want people to go there and start to formulate a plan because that calculator you can play about with it put your details in in terms of your age when you want to retire you can vary those details how much money you've got in your pension how much you might want to contribute each month how much your employer might want to contribute and it will tell you or estimate based on certain assumptions about investment growth 
how much your pension pot will be worth in the future and when you come to retire. You can change that retirement date. You can tell the calculator that you might want to increase your contributions, retire later. You can make a plan, see what the future might hold. So stop burying your head in the sand because every day that goes by where you don't do something about your pension planning is another day that you lose in time and compounding. So it's one of the things that everybody wishes they could do is turn back the clock. So let's make sure that we don't keep burying our head in the sand. And most people do, unfortunately. That is just the way the world works. Following on from that, though, I want people to not ignore their state pension and don't assume you're going to get a full state pension. So obviously, when you get to state pension retirement age, you will get a pension based upon your national insurance contribution history. Now, you need to have 35 years worth of contributions to get the full state pension. Now, a lot of people think they will automatically, they will get the full state pension. Everyone gets the same. You don't. So what I want people to do, if you're in your 40s, and particularly if you're in your 50s, and you're getting towards the latter stages of your 50s, make sure you get a state pension forecast so you can go online and you can get that from the .gov.uk website again we'll put a link in the show notes and you can find out what sort of state pension you are likely to get but more importantly from that is that you can find out if there is going to be a shortfall if there's a gap because you've not paid enough national insurance contributions now for women listening to this podcast if you've taken a career break so if you're in your 40s for example you may have taken a career break at some point in the recent history in the last six years that's the key part where you may not have been paying national insurance contributions so if you can check your national insurance contribution record by for example getting a state pension forecast then you can see if there's any gaps on your national insurance contribution record and if they're in the last six years you can pay to have those gaps filled and it normally works out very cost effective to do so because obviously you're paying an amount now but you're going to get a state pension in the future that's going to be obviously increased by the government. So if you're a female, make sure you do that. Don't just think when you go back to work, there's nothing for you to do. Equally, for females who may have taken a career break, they've got to think about their own pension at work as well or their own private pensions because they may have stopped contributing to those or they may not have increased their contributions over time paused them or whatever so there's likely there's going to be a period of time where they weren't contributing to a pension or they weren't contributing as much as say a male counterpart would have done because their wage would have been increasing over time so they need to be mindful of that when they do in their planning and looking at it that they might have to increase their contributions to their pensions to make up that shortfall but it's one of those things don't bury your head in the sand let's make a plan and seek advice from a independent financial advisor we put links to in the show notes to sites like vouched for where you can find reviews of good advisors in your area you can approach them if you want but there are plenty of obviously tools online that you can look at like i mentioned the money to the masses pension calculator that can at least give you a starting point in your own research don't opt out of auto enrollment is another mistake i think people make they start focusing on perhaps trying to buy a house or doing things like that when they're in their 30s and they may have opted out of auto enrollment for some reason make sure you are part of your auto enrollment at work so you're getting those contributions from your employer on top of your ones going into your pension pot as well next i would again i'm focused on pensions at this point in time when you get towards your 50s but particularly around the age of 55 where you'll be able to start accessing your private pensions for example you need to think carefully about what happens there now when it gets to drawing on your pension i think it's probably the best time in life to get financial advice because of the rules that happen and the options that you've got around that time and sometimes making the wrong mistake can cost you in the future it can have knock-on effects so for example if you want to go into drawdown so you're going to use your pot of money to provide an income i would suggest you go and seek advice if you go back to podcast 271 i did a whole piece about drawdown and how that works when you're taking money out of a defined contribution pension so go back and listen to that podcast i mean i hope people find it useful when i go back and list the old podcast to listen to because i go back and listen to them to make sure the bits are relevant for people so they don't have to trawl through it themselves the mistakes around pensions that can happen when you're in your 50s are people taking money 
from their pension just because they kind of can. That makes sense. Needlessly drawing money from their pension pot. And the issue with doing that is if you're going to take money out of a tax free environment, it's therefore going to enter a taxable environment potentially. And it's also going to be part of your estate. So it's going to, in the end, potentially be liable to inheritance tax as well. So there's a lot of planning that needs to be taken account of, like optimizing the tax position when you're taking money out of a pension. There are people who take income, for example, out of a pension. And they might decide to take more than the tax-free cash amount they've got. So more than 25% lump sum might take a bigger amount. The issue is that you are therefore going to be liable to taxation on that excess. And again, if you go back to that podcast episode, I explain how all of that works. If you take money in excess of your tax-free cash from your pension pot, so you then start taking an income that's taxable, you can trigger the money purchase annual allowance. And what that does is it reduces the amount you can pay into a pension in future down to £4,000 a year. So there may be people, for example, who want to continue working all through their 50s into their 60s and keep putting money into their pension, but think that I can take some money out now. I just take a bit of money out now for whatever reason, treat themselves. But they could do that and it can therefore limit what they can put into a pension over the next decade for example. So you want to make sure you don't trigger that unnecessarily. So it's something to bear in mind. Again, take advice. And there are times when you're thinking about taking money from a pension that it can be better to take it from a different source, maybe savings, maybe a stocks and shares ISA, whatever it could be. Let's say, for example, markets were crashing and your pension had plummeted in value. Withdrawing money lump sums out of that will start to hamper its ability to rebound, will hamper its ability to provide you with a sustainable income over the long term, because you've obviously taken a bigger chunk of it percentage wise out. And so you need to bear that in mind. One really interesting thing that people might not realise is pension wise is a government initiative where you can get free guidance meetings if you are over 50. And it explains the options. So these meetings, you can go online, we'll put a link to the in the show notes, you can get a free 45 to 60 minute consultation where you are in which you'll be explained your options for your defined contribution pensions, not your final salary ones, just your defined contribution pensions, and particularly around options of taxation or your options when it comes to taking money out of pensions. So make sure you use that facility if you haven't got an advisor. That is free. It's a mistake not to use that. Actually, Damon, just on that, PensionWise is what it's been called for many, many years now, but it's actually in the stages of being rebranded across to something called Money Helper. So don't be surprised when you click on our links or when you look at that website, if you see Money Helper in the title banner, it's the same thing. It's PensionWise being rebranded across into a slightly different name. But it's the same thing. And before I move on, Andy, and leave pensions behind, other things to make sure people don't do is exceed the annual allowance that they're allowed to put into a pension each year, because it does taper if you earn lots of money, like 240 grand a year, and don't exceed the lifetime allowance, the amount that you've got in your pensions. And that lifetime allowance is just over a million pounds. So that's not going to impact a lot of people. But as people become more affluent, these are things they need to be mindful of. Now I'm going to move on from pensions, wills and lasting powers of attorney. Now if you go back to podcast 179, I did a whole piece on lasting powers of attorney and explain what they are. Essentially, you're able to give somebody the power to control your finances or make decisions on your finances or your health if you are mentally not capable of doing so in the future. So let's say you had an accident or you had Alzheimer's. Now, obviously, That is something that's very important. Most people don't do it. And go back to that podcast and I explain in there how you can do it. It's very cheap to do it. It's about £80 to be able to do it online on the .gov UK website. But also make sure you have a will. Almost one thing that most people I ever meet and ask me about things they should do, putting a will in place for a lot of people, especially when you're in your 40s and 50s, you should have done that. Especially if you have children, especially you have assets you want to pass on to make sure you have a will in place. And so that will will obviously even state who will look after your children should you and your partner die at the same time, for example. So the wills and lasting power of attorney, they are things that you need to be thinking about and doing, but not just for you, but also for your parents. So it may be a slightly uncomfortable conversation to have around 
death, but it's something that we all should be talking about. So have they got lasting powers of attorney in place? Because if you don't have them, then it can be a little bit more difficult to actually sort things out if things go wrong, somebody becomes not capable of making their own financial decisions, for example. You can put these things in place and they only trigger the lasting power of attorneys when they're needed in the future. So it's something to look at. We'll put links in the show notes back to the podcast and things that you can read. But it's a discussion you should be having within your own family, say with your husband or wife, but also potentially with your parents, because they could be the people who may become mentally incapacitated at some point. And of course, leading on from that is inheritance tax planning. So don't think that people won't die. Unfortunately, people do. There could be inheritance tax to pay if somebody were to die, let's say your parents. You need to have these conversations about this stuff before it occurs. Have they thought about it? How big is their estate? Have they got wills in place? Then the other thing is, you should not ignore the idea of care, especially for, again, parents or grandparents. Go back to podcast 330. We did a whole piece about care and funding care in future. So it's something, again, when you're 40s and you're in your 50s, don't just ignore that potential problem in the future or how you're going to overcome that. Now, next one I'm going to go on to, I mean, I'm, this isn't a complete list. There are going to be people who listen to this podcast and go, he didn't say about this or about that. I'm just going through as many as I could think of. Mortgages. Now, not having a plan to pay off your mortgage is not a good place to be. Now, most people these days will have repayment mortgages, but there are going to be quite a few people who may be in their 40s and 50s who have an interest-only mortgage because they are a legacy product when they took them out before. Don't bury your head in the sand about that because you're going to have to have a plan of how you're going to repay that. And that may mean that you end up downsizing or something like that, but you need to think about that and put a plan in place of maybe where you're going to move or be able to save money or invest money to be able to pay that mortgage in the future. You don't want to get to the point where you suddenly are at a stage where you're facing a huge debt that you haven't made contingency plans to actually pay. But moving slightly to one side of that, as you're getting older and you're in your 40s but going into your 50s and then moving into your 60s is the idea of mortgaging or remortgaging. Because as you get older, particularly when you're late 50s, but when you cross over into your 60s, your options when it comes to remortgaging start to reduce. So in your 40s, you should be able to get a mortgage for like 25 years because we are now working longer. And mortgage companies are aware of that. So the ages at which you can get a mortgage are now much higher than they used to be. So you can still get mortgages way into your 60s, for example. So there's not a problem, but the length of the mortgage will eventually start to become an issue. So not so much when you're 50s, but as you get into your 60s, you might not be able to get a mortgage, say, if you wanted a remortgage that's longer than a 10-year or 15-year repayment period. So you need to be mindful of that if you're going to be in that scenario. And equally, you might want to think about that if you're going to need to move and you're going to have to fund that with a mortgage. So again, that's something to bear in mind. In terms of investing, staying in cash is a mistake that people make. They'll move their money across perhaps or they invest their money in an ISA or a pension and they leave it in a low risk fund or even cash for a long period of time. People do that in drawdown a lot. That's one of the things the FCA is worried about, that people are leaving their money in cash within a pension and then drawing an income from it or chunks out of that money. And effectively, the money is losing its buying power because of inflation. So don't be one of those people. Seek advice. And most providers now, so pension providers, will have pathways when it comes to drawdown. We did a podcast on it and they will show you the sorts of portfolios that you can invest in to try and generate an income. A big one, if you're in your 40s and 50s, is a lack of insurance. I think we've done a fair few bits on the podcast about insurance. So I'm talking about life insurance, income protection insurance. So in protecting your income in case you have an accident or are incapacitated, potentially critical illness insurance and medical insurance. They're all different types of insurances that if you listen to the interview I did with Emma Thompson, and again, we'll put a link to it in the show notes, you'll see the power of having those insurances. And when you get to an, that age, and Emma is that age as well, she's one of our peers, that those insurances, because there are risks and your health isn't as good as it was when you were young, then they do come into their own. So it's something to think about in terms of insurances. Make sure you have some. Make sure your emergency fund isn't too small. So I talk about emergency funds a lot, but make sure it's not too small. Because as you earn more money, your bills get bigger, 
don't just sit there and think you've got a certain amount of money that will do in the in the bank. You need to increase it to be in line with your living expenses. So it's often a mistake that people will just sit there and think they might have a, a few thousand in the bank that that was sufficient. It may have been 10 years ago, but it won't be now. Just a couple more before we move on. Don't be complacent about debt. So I'm thinking about credit cards. Sometimes people live with them for so long, they actually just become complacent about the idea they'll be able to repay the debt. You don't want to get into that scenario because don't forget, your time is running out when it comes to earnings. And one of the last ones I'm going to mention is the mistake that you're going to assume your best earnings are yet to come. So people always assume they're going to earn more money year on year or going forward. You just don't know how your career will go or what will happen. And you may not earn a lot more money in the future. At some point, what tends to happen, you'll hit your peak earnings. And that may happen at different stages for some people. It won't necessarily happen the day before you retire. And of course, if you're therefore making a plan based upon the fact you're going to earn lots of money in the future, you don't pay down debt, for example, or you might be putting off doing something financially, whether it's move or anything on the assumption you're going to earn more money in the future. That might not happen. So don't fall into that trap of thinking that yeah do you know what the version of me tomorrow that's going to be richer more successful will solve all the problems of today because again that isn't going to happen and when you're in your 40s and 50s unfortunately the time on your career is starting to run out okay so moving on to the next piece then i'm going to be covering off buying a used car now this piece came about from something i was seeing in the money groups there seems to be a bit of a move for people where they started to actually look at their finances and think do you know what is this lease car or is this car that I've got on higher purchase actually good value for me anymore? I think since the pandemic, people are starting to look at their finances in a slightly different way. I also know anecdotally of a few people who've reduced their number of hours going into the office. And so their annual season ticket isn't as good value as it used to be. So they're looking at other ways that they can commute to the office. And some people have been looking at buying a second hand car, a used car, another little run around. And so it just made me think that that's a great thing that we can do on the podcast. Podcast. We can cover off a few of the questions that people have been posting. How do you buy a used car? What to look out for? And so I'm going to do that in the podcast today. So the first thing I wanted to cover off is where you can buy a used car from. And there's effectively four main places you can buy a used car. I'm ignoring the fact that you can buy a car from auction because that's more specialist and not something we're going to cover in the podcast. So firstly, a main dealer. Why would you buy a used car from a main dealer? Well, you'll receive a better level of vehicle preparation. Uh, So that means that they're going to do vigorous inspection. They're going to probably hand you a brand new MOT and it will come with a relatively good warranty, maybe six or 12 months. You'll also get some after sales support as well. The flip side to that is it's going to come at an extra cost. The dealer is likely to have high overheads and so you will be paying more. You need to work out whether you're prepared to pay more for that peace of mind. I mean, that would be up to you. Moving down then from a main dealer, you've got an independent garage. Now, you should expect, again, a good level of vehicle preparation. In most cases, the cars will come with a new MOT and some level of warranty, probably shorter warranty than a main dealer. A good point to consider, actually, is independent garages are keen to protect their reputation. They're independent. They survive on reputation, people giving a good word. And so that can be an advantage to you as the buyer. Again, you're likely to pay slightly more if you go through a garage, but you do get those extra assurances with the MOT and warranty. The next one is a driveway trader. Now, unbeknownst to me, I've actually bought a car from a driveway trader. I didn't know at the time. (laughs) I'm only laughing because it's just that sort of wheeler dealer thing. If there's anybody I knew who would have bought something from a done something like that, it would be you, Andy. I I, I think, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I just knew you would have bought something from probably some guy you met in a dark alleyway or under a bridge. It was less unscrupulous than that. It was on Auto Trader. I saw a car. We were in the market for a secondhand car. Our car had been written off in an accident that wasn't our fault. And we went along to see the car. And unbeknownst to us, it was a guy that was at his house, but he had about four or five cars parked up all along the driveway and over the opposite side of the road. He was having fish and chips with his family. It was all a bit bizarre, but trading in cars was his business and so he was a high turnover so a driveway trader is essentially just someone who trades vehicles for profit they often pick them up at auction and many cars are effectively sold as seen and there's usually a minimum amount of vehicle preparation that's done and very little after sale service it's basically they pick them up from the auction they maybe give it a little wash 
kick the tires, make sure everything's okay, and then and then flip them on to you. There are some good deals to be had from these guys, but it does come with that added risk. And then the final one of these four main types is your private seller. Now, these are the guys that tend to put their stuff on Auto Trader or Gumtree, and essentially it's someone looking to sell their own private car. Cars can be cheaper by buying from a private seller, and you have the added bonus where you can talk to them about I don't know why they're selling the history of the car. And it gives you an opportunity to sort of, you know, to gauge them as a person. You can sort of see straight away what sort of person they are and whether they've looked after it. So, you know, there's there's definite benefits from buying from someone who's lovingly looked after their car. Obviously, look for the telltale signs as if it hasn't been looked after. Remember, though, on the flip side of buying from a private seller, if you don't have a good deal of knowledge, you, you're literally going to be looking around the car and kicking the tires and, and not really know much. So it might be advisable to take someone who knows something about cars. If you've got a friend who's able to look under the bonnet and see what's there. And actually, here's a tip on this one. You can actually pay someone like the AA to do a vehicle inspection on your behalf, so long as the seller agrees. Um, it costs somewhere between 100 and 150 pounds, and they can actually give it a once over and effectively do. It's not really an MOT, but they will do a once over. They will check all the bits that you need as a buyer to make sure that it's going to be fully roadworthy. Finally, on the private seller side of things, you do have slightly less rights in terms of your consumer protection. We'll go on to consumer protection a little bit more, but because you're buying privately, you do forego some of that. One final tip on buying privately is insist that you do meet at an address rather than a public place because then you can make sure that the vehicle is registered to the address that you're going to to check out that car. So there's some really quick tips on who you can buy a used car from and what sort of protection you get from doing so. It's interesting because used car prices have been quite elevated partly because of the pandemic. People not traveling, they're not they've been more careful with their money like you said Andy and uh, not buying new cars. But also if you think about a 2-year-old car has probably spent one year just sitting almost on its driveway so the the value of that car is a little bit high and it was interesting because in america it's one of the biggest drivers of the uh, rising inflation figures in america was the, the uh, rising cost of used cars and it was kind of almost a felt like an slight irony that you could feel like you could almost get a car and sell it for more the next day but the used car prices were getting a bit silly so i've personally bought a used car in the past and i am know nothing about cars i mean my knowledge of cars is quite pathetic to be honest and i don't really have an interest in them but i went down the the independent garage and the dealerships garage to look at cars and funny enough some of the dealerships have what feels like almost like an added on independent garage if that makes sense they are part of the dealership but they're not all the cars that they've taken in part exchange they then sell them on so even if you went to a dealership of one particular brand they might have a garage that has all the cars they've just accepted as part exchange and because like andy said they give you some warranties and certain protections and I bought a car from one of those and it was I was glad I did because when I bought the car, immediately quite a bit of things, like a few things went wrong with it in, in the first like week or so of owning it. There were problems with the car that came to light. But because of those consumer protections, I actually got a thousand pounds worth of work on the engine done for free because at the end of the day, the car was faulty when I ultimately got it because the problems occurred very quickly so that was one thing had i bought it from a private seller i would have been absolutely stumped i'd have had to pay the money out myself so you do have some of that protection you might be arguing but that was just my experience i could just throw out there in the past that some people would buy from an off the driveway type of private seller but i did have a slightly negative initially but ultimately positive experience by buying a second-hand car from a garage and that brings me on really nicely to the next couple of bits to round up this piece, really talking about documents and car history and, and buyer protection. So talking of the documents, the most important document you need to check when buying a car, whether it's through a dealership or a private seller, is the V5C, also known as the registration document or the logbook. Make sure that the make and the model of the car you're buying matches that that is on the V5, as well as the number plate as well. Also, additional checks on that. You can check that the VIN, the vehicle identification number, matches the VIN on the vehicle. 
and that can normally be read from outside the vehicle under the lower part of the windscreen. If that does not match, that's an absolute giveaway that this car is, is probably a cut and shut job and you don't want to be anywhere near it. A good thing to remember about the V5C document, yes, it does prove the registered keeper, but is not a proof of ownership. So you might want to ask for proof of ownership from the seller, for example, a receipt of purchase or an invoice or something like that, just to tie the things together. There's no saying that the person you're buying from actually owns this vehicle. Looking at the car history, there's something you can do. I didn't know about this, but when you buy a secondhand car, you can actually check out the history of the vehicle. So it can help to tell you as the buyer the potential history of the vehicle and it will reveal if there's any hidden discrepancies in the car's history. Has it been written off, involved in a big accident? So the RAC does a really good guide on this and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's called the RAC Car Data Check and it will check the history. I think the AA has got one as well. You can Google that if you don't want to do the RAC one, but definitely do that before you buy a car. A couple of tips before you hand over the money. Before you transfer any funds, make sure that you're completely satisfied with what you're buying. I know that sounds really obvious, but we all get excited. We see something in the shop that we want and you you know, in a shop, it's fine because you've got all that consumer protection. Don't just go and give the money across straight away. Think about it. Make sure that you're completely satisfied. And when transferring funds, make sure that you use some some sort of trackable, traceable method, such as a credit or debit card. There are so many businesses, even small businesses, your driveway trader these days should have one of those card reading machines, the little square ones. You've seen them before, sum up. There's lots of different versions. Do it through that rather than handing over wads of cash. You can trace it. It's a proof of purchase. And ask for a receipt as well. Even a private seller should be able to provide you a receipt even if it's just something written on a piece of paper that confirms that you bought that from them for this price it does help finally just going on to your consumer rights there are different consumer rights depending on who you're buying from we mentioned the four ways you can buy a car earlier but under the consumer rights act all cars bought from dealers must be of satisfactory quality fit for purpose and as described. So that's quite a lengthy statement. There's quite a lot that you can actually come back to them on. Now, additionally, whether you've bought through a dealer or privately, the vehicle must be roadworthy, which means it must be fit and safe to drive. So even that car you've bought from the private seller down the road, if he has sold your vehicle that is not fit and safe to drive under section 75 of the road traffic act 1988 you can actually claim recompense for that because it's illegal for anyone at all to sell a vehicle that's not roadworthy and a quick point on that it is important to remember that an mot is not proof of roadworthiness a lot of people will look at an mot and go great it's it's fine you can drive it on the road the mot test certificate it only proves that it was roadworthy at the time that the certificate was issued. So if that's seven, eight, nine months ago, once you drive that car off of the driveway, it might not be roadworthy. The MOT was only saying that it was roadworthy however many months ago. So just that's an important distinction to make. Um, if you think you've been sold an unroadworthy vehicle, then you can report it to the local trading standards and the driver and vehicle standards agency, the DVSA. And depending on the issue that you report, you are actually entitled to a number of remedies up to six years after taking delivery of the vehicle. So that's quite incredible. You would think you're buying a used car, whether it's a banger or whether it's nearly new. You think to yourself, well, I can't really get much back. There are consumer rights in place for up to six years after you buy that vehicle, depending on what the issue is and who you bought it from. We'll put the full details on that because it's quite a lengthy list on the show notes. And just this final tip from me in in terms of your consumer rights, always consider buying a used car in part or in full using a credit card. You don't have to buy the whole car. You can put your deposit down. So long as you pay over a hundred pounds and not more than 30,000 pounds, you get the full section 75 consumer credit protection and that essentially means you've got extra protection from the card issuer itself to go back and get some sort of money back should things go wrong so that tip at the end was the one of the big ones that i did when i bought my used car from that garage because i paid for part of the deposit using a credit card because as long as the item so in this case a car must cost between a hundred pounds and thirty thousand pounds but you don't have to pay for all of it on the card so by just doing as andy said i had that safety net of the consumer protection because i paid for it on the credit card and even if the dealership isn't keen on it still 
push to pay for some of it on a credit card. So that's it. Last piece we're going to go on to now, Andy, is to do with passwords. Now, we all have passwords that we use online. And there was an interesting post by the National Cyber Security Center talking about passwords and actually we're normally told to create these extremely complicated hard to remember passwords and they came out and said that they're still promoting the idea of using three random words as a password and that might seem strange because you think they'd be quite happy for the crazy random letters that you're going to try and remember and stuff like that but when they've looked at it they said that Actually, three random words does work well because it does still create an unusual combination of letters, which still makes it a strong password. There is an interesting bit of analysis they talk about that, ironically, some of the techniques that some of these systems use to create passwords, and in, and particularly people when they create hard-to-guess or they think hard-to-guess passwords, is that they will replace an O with a zero, for example, or a, a number one with an exclamation mark or something like that in their password that they're trying to make more difficult to crack. So those sorts of things do in a way weaken the password that you're creating because the algorithms trying to crack these passwords from these hackers etc do try those sorts of combinations as well so they are saying that there are a number of reasons why putting three random words together is still a good way to create a password mainly because like they say it does create a strong password with some odd combinations of letters but more importantly it also is usable so it creates passwords that are both strong and are easy to remember and that means that people aren't having to write them down so a number of reasons why they have decided to keep promoting the three random word approach, as I say, because it does create some unusual combinations of letters, but mainly because it creates passwords that are both strong and easy to remember. So that makes the system much more useful to the wider public. And it means they're more likely to actually create strong passwords because you know what it's like. Lots of people, when they have to register a new password, will end up probably just because they're trying to remember it in the future, create something that isn't particularly strong, as long as it just matches the rules that that particular site requires. But the ultimate thing, which I'm going to bring Justin onto the podcast, interestingly. So Justin does a lot of our tech stuff and he is a bit of a tech nerd. And the NCSC do say that the best thing to do is still to use a password manager for your important account. So I want to get Justin on the show to talk about password managers, what they are, and quickly uh, explain some of the ones out there that you might want to use. I'm going to go quiet on this part of the podcast because as you will probably know if you've listened to a show where Justin has been on, he sounds exactly like me being my twin. So Andy's going to talk to him for a bit and then I'll come back on at the end of the show. Okay, Justin, welcome to the show. So password managers, what on earth are they? How do they work? Password managers are quite simple, really. They are either browser extensions or software that, in effect, you store all of your passwords in and you have one master password to rule them all that gives you access to those passwords and they can autofill your forms, etc. I mean, crudely, are, I mean, I would split them into two. There's kind of your free and your paid versions of them. And your free versions are things like your browser extensions. So I think my, many of us would be aware of things like uh, Chrome's password managers that pop up from time to time and Safari's. These ones are browser-based and they tend to suggest storing your passwords when you enter them into a site. They get stored into the cloud servers of those services. And, and when you go to those sites in the future, you can put them in. The second type is what I'd call third party. So they're different services that are independent. I'll give you a couple of examples of these. There's one called One Password. There's another called LastPass. They are probably the biggest in the market. And what they are, they're third party software and services that will store your passwords and usernames all in their services and also on your devices. Crucially, that's the biggest difference. And they're encrypted. And the key concept of all of these things is that you have one very strong password that you access these services. And then within these services, all of your passwords are remembered and they're all unique and they are all difficult to remember. Ultimately, you should always have a unique, strong password everywhere and it should always be different in every location and that's why you use a password manager okay so that's interesting i mean understanding how these work now 
one of my biggest issues and probably where I come unstuck is is trying to come up with passwords and which is probably why sometimes I end up putting the same ones through and creating that security issue so do these services whether it's the free ones offered by the browsers or the third party do they offer any sort of help with regards to coming up with passwords do, do they do it for you for example in short yes they all do if you're sign up to a new service they also just a password you can click to accept that and then it will store it you don't have to remember it the service will store it because when you go onto that site in the future, it will say, I recognize this site or this app or this piece of software. This is the password I log it in for you. That is one of the key benefits of it because you don't have to come up with them and you don't have to remember them. The one thing I, I do want to kind of cover because I know there's lots and lots of people going to be listening to this podcast and going, yeah, but how's that any safer that I have one password that gives access to everything and that seems to be less safe. And actually, I've got unique passwords everywhere and I write them down on a book. The difference in that scenario is I can just walk into your house break into it or you leave that book somewhere i can read them with these services those passwords are inaccessible they can only be accessed by that strong unique password that looks after that service and crucially they are encrypted they can't be accessed by anyone the other thing i would say to people is that you writing down passwords everywhere yeah sure that 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 feels sensible because no one else has access to them these services routinely don't have access because of the encryption so they can't see your passwords either the other things they do and this is one of the big things i would suggest why people would want to start using password managers either in the browser or some of these third parties is they actually scan the internet that what is known as a dark web for password exposure so safari do this chrome do this. they all do it they'll alert you and say do you know that these password combinations using and password combinations you have they're out there they're on sites to be bought and sold and people are trying to use these to access things so do not use them change them i use these services and i've been alerted to passwords that i've been told to change it's two clicks i update it and suddenly i've got a fresh password that means that that service is protected that is another reason to use it. So Justin, do you have any personal preference on like the free browser options or the third party options? And actually sort of another question on that then begs the question, what do you get for the paying extra through the third parties? What extra do you get? Ultimately, it comes down to personal choice. The difference between these paid services and the free services comes down to the extra benefits they have and the usability functions that they have. So the free ones that are often the browser based ones, you can only use them in your browsers, where a lot of the paid for ones, they work cross device. So if you're on your mobile and you're trying to open an app, it will log that in. It can do that. It doesn't have to just be on the internet, it can be on your apps. There are some free services that allow you to do that. The issue that they have is they always tend to have restrictions, i.e. the number of passwords they store, the number of devices they support. The other thing, the premium services they have is you can designate emergency contacts. So if I use, let's say, for example, LastPass, which is uh, one of the services, I could designate you as a emergency contact. And if I've lost access to everything as a LastPass user, you can give me access back to my account. So there's lots of things. like, And also you can share these across your family. So your partner can access all the sites that you have the passwords for, and they don't necessarily have to have access to all of your accounts. You can share it amongst your family. So again, Netflix would be an example. Everyone can access Netflix through these services and you've not actually written down the passwords anywhere. And before I go, there's one last thing I would love everybody on this podcast to do. And this is one of the things that people forget. They go on about their passport and things like that. In my opinion, your email is one of the most important things you access because all roads lead back to your email address. If you reset passwords, they go back to your email. People say to prove they are you, they send you an activation link. If your email password is used somewhere else, if it is not very hard to actually work out, it's not unique, stop this podcast, go and change your email password because I can guarantee if someone gets into your email, they can pretty much with a little bit of time and not much effort access everything. So go and change your password, put two-factor authentication on, which will hopefully slow people down and stop them accessing because a code will come to you or a text to verify via code. So please do that because it's the one thing that is easy to do and will have the biggest impact in making sure you don't fall foul of a security breach. So there we go. That's your homework for this week. Anybody who's kept that same password for however many years and it's easy to guess, just, just get it changed. It's just the biggest thing you can do. So that's it. We're done for this week. Thanks ever so much to Justin for coming on at the 
Damien there. Damien then bringing you back in. We're done for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter, it's at moneytothemasses with the number two. And we're on Instagram, TikTok. Don't forget about TikTok, the Money to the Masses community group as well. We've got our YouTube videos out there as well. Consume it all, comment, share. And review the podcast if you can. And so, Damien, I'm looking at the screen opposite me now. I can see Justin's gone one way. You've come in from the other. I mean, you are twins. It doesn't look like much has changed, but you're back on the show. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm back on very briefly as, as we wrap the show up. I thought Justin was going to go into telling everybody to close down the number of tabs they have on their screen. Because on my, while we were recording the podcast, I could see he's sort of like twitching because I've got about 20 tabs open on our, on my uh, browser. And given that Justin does half our like, IT stuff, he, he gets quite twitchy, doesn't he, Andy? About <laughs> It's one of the things I always do when we go on a team call and we have to share screens. I'll quickly go in and just tick off a few tabs just to make myself feel better and know that I'm not going to get a bit of a telling off from uh, Mr. Tech. So, yeah, I'm away next week. Don't break anything. Um, Andy, and I will see everybody on the other side in September. So to the listeners, until next time, to Damien, until the time after next. Until the time after next. <laughs> <laughs>